My name is Jack Dubinsky, and I am the director of the Mariah Mitchell Aquarium. If you guys have not been yet, please do come. It's super cute, and we have all sorts of marine creatures, and uh, we open June 12th this year. Um, but I'm super excited to talk to you, talk to you all about um, octopuses today. Um, and just an overview of today's lecture. Uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about octopus um, taxonomy and biology. I'm going to turn this guy on. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, octopus intelligence as well and uh, talk about the biodiversity um, within Order Octopoda. And uh, we're going to finish off talking about Cthulhu, um, which is a really cute octopus that we had at the Mariah Mitchell Association in 2021 and 2022. And so we're all going to um, remember back to high school, learning about taxonomy, um, probably um, our like, least favorite part of biology class. But um, I'm going to go and talk about um, basically the classification of octopuses and talk a little bit about where they fall in the um, tree of life and some of their relatives. Um, and, and starting off here, I'm sure you all know that octopuses are animals, so they're in kingdom animalia. Um, so they are not plants or fungi or bacteria or archaea. They are in phylum mollusca. Um, so um, not eat, did my mic just, oh, there we go. Um, they're in phylum mollusca, so they are like sea stars and um, urchins. They're not arthropods like crabs and insects. Um, they're not cnidarians like coral and jellyfish. Um, they're not chordates like birds, mammals, and fishes. Um, and, and diving a little bit into the um, phylum mollusca, um, there are a few um, interesting classes. Um, class the um, two-shelled organisms, so that's like clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, things like that. Um, we also have class Gastropoda, which includes uh, terrestrial and um, aquatic snails and slugs um, and allies. Um, and um, octopuses belong to class Cephalopoda. Um, there are a couple other molluscan classes. Um, like, I don't know if you guys have been to the intertidal environment and seen the little roly-poly looking um, things on the side. Those are uh, chitons. Um, but uh, yeah, so within class Cephalopoda, um, a few orders. Um, uh, so, actually, um, I need to update this. But uh, there's a, so um, there's basically four orders of um, true squids. Um, there is an order that includes the cuttlefish and um, and bobtail squids. Um, the nautiluses um, belong to their um, own order as well. Um, but octopuses belong to order Octopoda. And um, let's talk a little bit about what makes an octopus an octopus. Um, so some key characteristics here, um, which distinguish octopuses from other cephalopods. Um, so octopuses have eight arms and no tentacles. Um, and within the context of cephalopods, an arm is an appendage with suckers all the way down. And a tentacle is an appendage with suckers only at the end. So um, squid, for example, have um, a bunch of arms and then two longer tentacles with suckers only at the end of them. Um, also unique to octopuses is their neurobiology. So um, I'm sure you know y'all, um, you know, reading the book and um, learning about octopuses, um, know that you know two thirds of their neurons are actually within their arms and not um, associated with their their brain, um, and that is unique to octopuses. Octopuses do not have a shell or any shell-like remnants. So um, cephalopods um, have evolved from um, shelled um, mollusks, and um, in, in cephalopods, in most groups of cephalopods, the shell is, is reduced or absent. So um, you know the nautiluses have their full shell, but squids have their super thin. Uh, they call it the squid pen, um, which provides a little bit of structure. Um, cuttlefish have the cuttle bone, which is a long bone that goes down that provides structure. Um, octopuses do not have any structures like that. Um, there are a few species that have a shell remnant, which is a teeny tiny bit of shell, but it doesn't really provide um, structure to the animal, um, which makes octopuses um, particularly um, pliable. So um, basically, um, as you know, I'm sure you guys know, octopuses can basically 
you know, become gelatinous and squeeze through like teeny tiny little holes. And that's because they don't have any bones um, or rigid structures really inside of their body to prevent them from fitting into spaces. And um, just a little bit of uh, the anatomy here. Um, first, I want to point out that the, um, the mantle here, like I, you might catch me saying the head, but this isn't a head kind of implies that the body is elsewhere, and almost all of the octopus's organs are um, within the mantle there. Um, so, so octopuses have three hearts and uh, blue blood. And the blood is blue because of hemocyanin, um, which is a copper-based blood pigment that carries the oxygen around instead of hemoglobin, which is the iron-based um, blood pigment that we have that makes our blood red. Um, and blue blood sounds super unique, but within the animal kingdom, it's, it's not all that cool. Like uh, most crustaceans have blue blood and a lot of mollusks have blue blood. Um, so the brain is shaped kind of like a donut and it's between their eyes um, and that helps um, them basically have like really quick response times between seeing something and being able to process and react to it. The aperture in the siphon allows uh, the octopus to um, basically take in water um, for respiration, so they, their gills are inside of their um, mantle, but also um, expel water um, along with um, any waste products, anything like that comes out through the siphon there. They also use the siphon for jet propulsion, so if they need to move really quickly, they can blast out water through their siphon um, and swim backwards really quickly. Oh, uh, most octopuses um, have ink sacs, um, and it appears all octopuses have a venom sac. Um, the ink sac is located basically near where the water flows, so if they're ejecting ink, um, they're inserting it into the water, and then as they pump out through the siphon, the ink comes out through the siphon, and the to the beak, so as they're consuming something, they can inject venom into it as they are breaking it open. And the arms and suckers are all around. Um, and you know, as you know, uh, soul of an octopus explores, and uh, my octopus teacher explores, the the suction cups are are pretty um, pretty cool structures. So the the suckers are able to um, you know create a suction force, which allows them to grab. But the suckers can also manipulate around objects. So even though they don't have like opposable thumbs, they can kind of grab things e with each individual sucker. Um, the suckers also have chemoreceptors, so they can smell and taste um, with them as well. And um, because the arms themselves have um, neurons in them, the arms can actually um, operate somewhat independently of the brain. So um, they, you know, they, with their brain, choose, you know, big picture um, behaviors, and then the arms can explore and, and do things without consulting the brain first, which is um, unique to octopuses. And um, some of the octopus media doesn't really dive into the octopus life history, which is, um, I think is super important about under, um, part of understanding these animals. Um, so it all starts out with a male octopus and a female octopus. Um, and um, basically, uh, the male octopuses um, have um, a special, basically one of their arms is modified to be able to deliver spermatophores to the female. Um, and um, some octopuses um, will just use it to provide sperm to the female. Um, the Argonauts, which um, I'll show you guys a little bit later, like remove their entire arm and present it to the female and die in the process. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, like Van Gogh thought he was being all unique, mutilating himself for love, and Argonauts have been doing it for thousands of years. Um, but anyway, one way or another, um, oops, um, we have fertilized eggs. And um, some species of octopuses will defend, the females will guard the eggs until they hatch. Um, some species of octopuses lay their eggs and then move on. Um, and the eggs hatch, and most species, um, the offspring are referred to as paralarvae um, and are planktonic and pelagic, meaning that these little itty bitty organisms are floating around in the ocean. Um, even though the adult forms are, you know, maybe benthic and live on the ground or in rocks, um, these little guys are swimming around in the water, eating um, other zooplankton, like little copepods, baby mollusks, things like that. And um, I always like to tell people what it's like to grow up in the plankton, because all of these different animals, you know, fishes, um, bivalves, um, sea stars, tunicates, all of these different organisms with planktonic um, larval stages, it's the most hostile place on planet Earth to grow up. 
Um, you know, most of these animals, they're, um, the mortality rate is, you know, between 95 and 98% during these first few weeks of their lives. Um, living in the plankton is like just pure, like ecological carnage. You know, all these little tiny animals are just murdering each other. It's absolutely nuts. Uh, but the lucky few survive and grow up into adult octopuses. And um, just for scale, um, I have a little penny here. So these paralarvae are like, you know, smaller than a grain of rice often. Um, and, uh, get used to the penny. Pe the penny's going to be our friend today. Um, he's going to show up later. Um, but uh, yeah, so the paralarvae, um, hopefully, you know, some of them survive and grow up into adult octopuses. And depending on the species, this whole process can take as little as eight months. Um, and the longest lived octopuses, um, you know, can live to three to five years. Um, so um, that's kind of the scale of their whole life cycle. Um, so for this portion of the talk, um, it's going to be a little bit interactive. So um, scientists have been exploring intelligence in octopuses for many years and have given them various tests to assess, you know, how smart are they in this situation or that situation. Um, so what I'd like to do is I have 10 intelligence tests and every, I'm going to describe each test and if I can have everyone who thinks the octopus passed the test Raise your hand, and for those watching um, on the recorded version, I'll, I'll let you know what percentage of the room thinks that the octopus passed the test. Um, and be careful, because not all of the tests were passed. Um, so um, yeah, so if you think the, the octopus passed the test, raise your hand. Um, the first one is the discriminative learning test. So um, basically, um, the scientists tried to get the octopus to attack you know, the yellow um, the yellow square instead of the red one or the blue one. And do you guys think the octopuses were able to learn to attack only a certain type of square? Raise your hands if you think the octopus passed. Looks like we got 70% of the room thinks they passed. They did indeed pass that test. Um, taking it one layer further, um, we have the conditional discrimination, um, yeah, just, uh, discrimination test. Um, so this one, they had the octopus learn, you know, let's say attack the yellow square, but not the red or the blue square, and only attack the yellow square when the bubbler in the aquarium is on or the tank light is on. So they added another condition, um, and they, the octopus only got the reward when it, when it did the right task in the right conditions. So show of hands, who thinks the octopus passed the conditional discrimination test? It looks like we got 60% of the room thinks they passed. Whoops. They did indeed pass that test as well. Next one, the generalization test. So this one basically, um, they taught the octopus to do something and then they presented it with a different but similar um, you know, condition set to pass and see if it um, could pass the test based on what it had learned from a different set of conditions. So in this, it, we train the octopus to attack the yellow square and then you show it a yellow cube. Does it know to attack the cube because it's similar to the square? Or by a show of hands, did it pass the generalization test? See, yeah, it's like 60, 70%. And they did indeed pass the generalization test as well. Next one, ability to use tools. So can octopuses use tools um, from around them to help them solve tasks and help them survive? Show of hands, who thinks they passed? All right, that's like 90% of the room. They can indeed use tools. Um, you know, if you use shells to defend themselves. Um, there are really cute videos of um, little octopuses like dragging around a beer bottle and they get scared and they go into the beer bottle like little hermit crabs. Um, my favorite example of tool use is the blanket octopus, which is um, even as an adult, they live um, you know, in the open ocean, and they will tear off the tentacles of Portuguese men of war and wield them as weapons to attack things and defend themselves. Um, so they're, they're pretty, yeah, they're smart. Um, all right, next test. Um, do octopuses have the ability to plan ahead? And this test was modeled after the uh, famous uh, Stanford marshmallow test, um, which is, was basically, uh, you put an animal in a room with marshmallow, and if they eat the marshmallow, that's great, they get a marshmallow. But if they are able to um, wait another 30 minutes or however long, they will be rewarded with two marshmallows. Um, so um, they did a similar test on octopuses and by show of hands, do we think they were able to plan ahead like 50% of the room? They were indeed able to plan ahead and learn that patience um, can be rewarding. 
All righty, round two, we're doing social and emotional intelligence, and be careful they didn't pass all of them this time. Um, so let's see, first one here, um, the learning by watching test. So they tested to see if an octopus that didn't know how to do a task could watch another octopus do the task successfully and see if the first octopus could learn how to do that by watching the other octopus do the task. By show of hands, who thinks the octopus passed the learning by watching test? Oh my gosh, 80% uh, or so of the room thinks they learned um, by watching and oops, they indeed passed that test. Next one, social play, um, which a lot of scientists um, consider to be a uh, marked sign of intelligence. Um, do octopuses interact, hang out with other octopuses um, with no practical purpose um, just to explore and hang out with them? By show of hands, how many do we think do social play? Let's see, we got like 20% of the room thinks they passed. They indeed failed that one. So do not... And um, they, if, they're, if two octopuses are near each other and, and exploring each other, they are either about to reproduce or one of them is about to eat the other one. Um, so yeah, they're, they're not friends. Um, but similar test, non-social play. So um, do octopuses use objects in their environment or, or hang out with animals in their environment for no practical reason, but just to hang out and explore with them? Um, by show of hands, do you guys think they play with objects. Let's see, we got like 60% or so thinks, think they play with objects. They do. Um, and so um, like in aquariums, we, we give them toys to play with. Um, in the wild, they'll play with fish and things like that. Um, so they like to explore their environment for sure. All righty, the next one, um, are octopuses able to recognize individual people just based on their face? Um, so like you know, let's say, like, can an octopus recognize its aquarist versus an aquarium guest, even if the aquarist changes their clothes or shaves or changes their hairdo? Do we think octopuses are able to recognize individual people? Show of hands. Looks like we got 90% of th people think they can, and they do indeed recognize individuals. Last one here is um, we've got the mirror self-recognition test. Um, this is an interesting one. So um, basically this test, you have an animal and you give them anesthesia, knock them out somehow. And then scientists will put like a little tag or a blemish somewhere on their face that's out of their field of view. So like, for example, if you have ketchup on your, on your cheek, you can't see it unless you look in a mirror, right? Um, so they put a blemish on the animal and then they wake up and then they put a mirror in front of them and they look at themselves and they see the blemish and they, they know they recognize themselves in the mirror because they can see the blemish through the reflection and then they start to scratch it or try and get it off. Um, so do we think octopuses passed the mirror self-recognition test? Show of hands. Let's see, we've got like maybe 30% of the room thinks they passed. They indeed failed the mirror test. Um, so they, um, the octopus tested uh, did not show any different behaviors um, looking at itself in a mirror versus looking at another octopus through the tank glass. Um, so um, that's it. And um, I also wanted to mention that scientists have been studying octopus intelligence for many, many years. There are way more than 10 tests that have been done on them, but um, I thought this was a, a fun little uh, selection there. Um, Shifting gears here, um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about um, the diversity of octopuses. Um, there's over 300 species of octopuses worldwide. Um, they come in all sorts of sizes and um, have different like habitats and lifestyles and different diets and things like that. Um, and, and some of the, um, you know, we think of octopuses as these like, you know, benthic animals that are living in rocks and caves and stuff, but um, some species have a, com oops, a completely different lifestyle. And I wanted to start with the giant Pacific octopus. Uh, this is uh, the species that was um, in Sullivan octopus, um, and there is a diver um, behind it uh, for reference. And the giant Pacific octopus is the, the largest octopus species that we know of, um, and also the longest lived with an average lifespan of three to five years. Um, and this is just another photo of a giant Pacific. Um, this female is guarding her eggs, and um, 
if you guys look carefully, you might be able to see the little um, dark dots in each one of those eggs. Those are the little eyes of the developing embryos. And for reference, we have Mr. Penny here. Uh, to at, like basically grain of rice um, size eggs um, on the giant Pacific octopus, the largest octopuses. This is the smallest octopus in the world. This is the star sucker pygmy octopus. Um, rocking its like inch and a half or so arm span on a human finger. We also have the Pacific blue ringed octopus. Um, there's actually a few species of blue ringed octopuses, um, the most venomous of which has enough venom to kill 25 adult humans and lives in, you guessed it, Australia, um, as well as other places in the Indo-Pacific as well. Um, so if you guys are going there on vacation, I'd. Uh, you know, maybe not stick your hand in the tide pools or at least pay attention when you're doing that. Um, there's a famous video online of like some guy, you know, holding one in his hands, like, look what I found, and it, you know, could kill him easily. Um, this is the Dumbo octopus, which is a deep sea species, um, and you know, thousands of meters under the surface. Um, they have little fins that flap around to help them swim around, um, and they're pretty stinking cute. Um, similar to the Dumbo octopus, we have the flapjack octopus, um, another deep sea species. They get their name because they like to smush themselves flat like a pancake. Um, and uh, rocking the, the red coloration, a lot of deep sea animals like to be red um, because red light um, pierces does not pierce very deep into the ocean. So um, if you are red in color and there's no red light, there's no light reflecting off of your body to reveal yourself to predators and prey. This is the Argonaut, and Argonauts are pelagic, um, even as adults, and um, I mentioned that octopuses don't have shells, um, but the female Argonauts are able to create a shell. Um, this is not attached to her body, so she can leave it whenever she wants, and octopuses like to lay their eggs in caves and nooks and crannies, and if you're living in the middle of the open ocean, um, no such place exists, so why not build your own cave? Um, and so they build these like paper-thin um, calcium carbonate shells and lay their eggs inside of them. Um, and argonauts are really cool. They um, sometimes live symbiotically with um, jellyfish, so when, they're get, when they get tired of um, swimming, they'll find like a big jellyfish and suck onto them with their suckers and just like hang out on the jellyfish as it goes around. Um, they're pretty cute. And uh, they live in tropical environments only, so um, we probably won't see them on Nantucket. And uh, the last species I wanted to talk about is the common octopus, um, which uh, gets its name because its range is basically the entire Atlantic Ocean. Um, they're found as far north as Canada and as far south as South Africa. Um, they're hanging out in the chilly waters of the Gulf of Maine and hanging out in tropical coral reefs. Um, they're also in the Mediterranean as well. And um, common octopuses, their lifespan is maybe one to two years two being the extreme extent, you, on average, one, and a half, one to one and a half years. Um, and I wanted to talk about this, one, because the octopus from uh, my octopus teacher was a common octopus. Um, the octopus Cthulhu, who I'm going to talk about later, was a common octopus. Um, and then also, I'm going to talk about octopus fisheries, and um, this species is one of the most heavily fished octopus species in the world. And talking about uh, octopus fisheries here, um, so about 350,000 metric tons of octopuses are fished every year, um, and that fluctuates, you know, a little bit, but on average, um, that's a pretty good estimate. And um, they're caught um, in a few interesting ways. They, you know, they have like normal um, octopus traps. Um, some are caught with you know, trawl nets going through the ocean. Um, but the most common and I think the most interesting way is by using these uh, little pots. And when people say crab pot, it's like a trap with like a, you know, a door or something like that. Um, octopus pots are literally clay pots. And they've been fished like this um, for hundreds of years. And basically, the idea is you tie like you know, dozens or hundreds of these things together at, you know, set intervals, like, you know, every three feet or something on a really, really long rope. And um, there's no 
latch or anything like that. Um, and they lay on the bottom of the ocean and octopuses, as they're hunting, they get really tired and they see this fabulous looking little cave, perfect size for them. And they crawl into, um, into the little pot there. And then as the fishing boat comes by and retrieves the pots, um, you know, the pot shaking and the octopus gets scared and their instinct is actually to retreat further into the pot rather than to escape. So there's no need for any sort of trapping mechanism there. And, um, and, you guys may know about octopuses. They're pretty freaking smart and good escape artists. So even if you had a trap door or something, chances are they'd be able to open it again. Um, so um, this is how they're caught um, mostly. Um, recreationally, they're caught by like spear fishing. So like if you go free diving with a spear gun or um, people just sometimes just catch them by hand. They just grab them and stick them in you know, a container. Um, but uh, yeah, most of them are, are caught like this. And um, interesting is, uh, I don't know if you guys have um, seen some articles about this, but um, there are quite a few entities that are interested in starting octopus farms. And, um, you know, this is causing quite, um, quite a controversy here. Um, and basically, there are, um, to date, no octopuses are, are cultured um, commercially in large quantities. Um, for, you know, scientists sometimes breed, um, you know, octopuses for research and things like that. But, um, you know, people are, you know, want to breed like, you know, millions of them, um, you know, with the, the idea of not depleting the wild octopus population. Um, and some ideas have, you know, like, you know, 10 of them per square meter. Um, and, you know, obviously the ethical questions are, you know, these are intelligent, solitary animals. You know, should we be keeping them so closely, um, you know, confined? Um, you know, the way some people want to kill them is by um, sticking them in cold water, which um, is really good for preserving the meat for culinary purposes, but um, it's not a very uh, quick death. Um, I'm, I personally am very curious to see how they can keep so many octopuses together without them eating each other. Um, I believe feasible to me, but um, so yeah, some, some of these projects are, are moving along. So um, we'll, we'll see where this goes for sure. Um, I also wanted to talk about um, super briefly um, some of the research that is being done on octopuses. Um, the first um, area, which I think is pretty cool, is uh, robotics. So um, this uh, is basically a, a robotic underwater um, soft robot arm um, that's able to like m move around and, and grab things. Um, and um, a lot of challenges in robotics is you know you need electricity and you're building them out of like strong. You need a strong like you know arm or or, or object. But how how can you have how can you build something that's soft when you need it to be and then can become really hard? Um, you know, just like an octopus, its you know, arm can be really gelatinous and then using its hydrostatic skeleton can you know, grab like 30 pounds on each sucker. Um, so there's robotic research being done on them. Um, so I don't know if you guys have heard of astrobiology. Um, it's kind of an interesting field, but it's uh, folks that are studying extra extraterrestrial life um, of course, we have not found extraterrestrial life yet, so they study it by studying um, organisms on Earth. So, um, you know, folks are like, oh, this moon has like a ton of tectonic activity. What might organisms look like there? And then they go to like the lava fields in Hawaii and study the crazy little bacteria that can survive in the super hot environment. Um, but they're, they're studying octopus intelligence for this reason because um, octopus in intelligence has evolved completely independently of um, chordate intelligence. So, um, yeah, like, like mammal intelligence, you know, it's all stemming from this one group, the chordata, um, which includes, you know, birds and fish and mammals and all these different, you know, pretty intelligent um, organisms. And then the mollusks are they're com a completely separate um, group which evolved um, intel intelligence differently. So how might, you know, that um, inform how intelligence might be on other planets? Um, so people are looking into that. Um, they're also studying them for biomedical science, um, specifically like their limb rege regeneration. So if like an octopus like loses a limb uh, to like a shark bite or something like that, it can regenerate um, the limb. And a lot of animals um, can regenerate parts of their body, but what's specifically interesting about octopuses is that they have neurons in their arm and they are able to regenerate the neurons as well. Which, you know, when you think about, um, you know, neurodegenerative diseases in humans, you know, how might we be able to learn about um, neuroregeneration in octopuses? 
um, and apply it to, to human medicine. Um, also interesting, I don't know if you guys have heard of the, the sea slug, which is also a mollusk, um, that you can chop its head off. Um, and the body will regenerate the head, including the brain, and the brain will remember the things that the decapitated head learned. Um, so there's a lot of interesting regeneration science being done um, in the mollusca, um, including octopuses. Um, also, uh, material science. So I'm, I'm sure you guys know the octopuses that can camouflage themselves at like the blink of an eye um, using their like kind of water balloon-like chromatophore cells. And uh, you guys know the military saw that and was like, hmm, can we, can we hide our tanks in plain sight? You know, can we, can we hide soldiers in plain sight? So they're being studied for their camouflage as well, and, and in addition to a bunch of other different fields. But um, they're such unique, interesting animals that there's really cool, unique research being done on them. And shifting gears here again, um, this is Cthulhu, um, the common octopus that we had at the Mariah Mitchell Association in 2021 and 2022. Um, she was a common octopus, um, like I mentioned before, and uh, was collected by a local lobsterman who pulled up the lobster pots and occasionally has little tiny octopuses squirming around off his deck of his boat. And when we got her, she was probably around two or three months old. And this is my first picture of Cthulhu. And um, this is her at the bottom of a five-gallon bucket. And I know what you guys are thinking. If only there was something on the screen, a reference point of some sort. Um, don't worry. We got your back. Mr. Penny is here again. Uh, so yeah, Cthulhu was um, just like her uh, mantle was just over the size of a penny. Um, and so I put her in this 10-gallon uh, or so tank, uh, pretty small. I just wanted to keep like a good eye on her. Um, I was worried that if I put her in a really big tank, um, I'd like lose her and never see her again. Um, but I wanted to, you know, keep tabs on her. So I put her in this um, little tank and... Um, with all sorts of rocks and caves and things for her to explore. Um, and I, I put a bunch of live animals in there, so just in case she wanted a meal, she could um, you know, go and hunt. And uh, this was her first meal here. This is her eating a live periwinkle snail. Um, and also um, a theme, kind of most of the live animals I tried to feed her um, are invasive species found on Nantucket. Um, so um, periwinkles are, are an introduced uh, species. And, um, and yeah, so this was her first meal. I don't know why she chose the periwinkle instead of the little crabs or the shrimp. Um, maybe it was because it was the easiest target or because it was the first thing she saw. Not sure. Um, but um, she enjoyed that little snail for sure. Um, the next day, uh, I caught a really cool video. And I'm sorry, the, the videography is, is not great because I, I shot this at night. So as the video plays, it'll become more clear. But um, here in the little circle, this is a, a shore shrimp, which is a very common um, little species. They get like this big. And um, this is a little shore shrimp um, exploring the new tank that I put it in. And there's Cthulhu hanging out behind that little piece of glass. Um, and one tentacle, there it goes. And, um, and, and you'll see a lot of these videos where um, she's eating live food. Like that first contact with the first sucker, that's game over um, for sure. All righty. Uh, next up, so um, this is a couple weeks later. Um, she literally like doubled in size in two weeks. Um, so I thought she was ready for um, a fish. And this little guy is an Atlantic silverside, um, which are common in Nantucket. Uh, they're like the French fries of the ocean. All the big fish love to eat them. They're full of calories and fat. And uh, there's Cthulhu skulking in the back. And um, she's nice and light color to match that ro white rock that she's about to crawl over. And um, she, yeah, it, it was interesting watching her grow and, and watching her hunting skills develop uh, because she was definitely, you know, learning how to hunt, um, you know, something. Um, and yeah, so she, she grabs the fish, and, and the fish had no idea she was coming, right? Um, and she goes back to her little cave. Um, so she, uh, yeah, became a very good hunter very quickly. And um, also, um, you know, like in Soul of the Octopus, you know, they had all these different toys and, and things that they gave to the octopus as enrichment, right, to keep it, uh, keep the octopuses mentally stimulated. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, the toys are great, and I, and I made some toys for her, but in the wild, what 
the reason why they're developing this intelligence is for um, evading predators and capturing prey. So um, I gave her as much live food as possible so she could really flex um, those muscles, so to speak, um, learn how to camouflage and, you know, quietly stalk prey. And, um, and you know, octopuses love to eat crabs. And I, and I was worried at first because, you know, crabs have, you know, the big claws, right? And they can fight back. And I was like, oh, you know, I'd be, you know, devastated if the crab hurt the octopus. Um, but um, a few days after that last video um, was like my first contact with her. So um, I gave her some food and then she grabbed my fingers with um, her tentacles. And she like tried to like grab me down to like hang out with her in her like little cave, um, which I obviously could not fit in. Um, but so eventually my fingers could not go any further into the cave. And as she was pulling my fingers down, um, she was holding on to one of the really, you know, relatively large rocks in her tank and actually pulled the rock up. Um, and it was, you know, a teeny tiny animal pulling up this like six pound rock. And I was like, oh, if she can lift that rock, you know, little crab is not going to have any chance of, you know, doing any damage to this animal. Um, and that on the back is an Asian shore crab, which are, um, an invasive species on the East coast. And, um, yeah. And so, um, basically when she attacks crabs, she would like just like completely envelop them. Um, and she has like a little bit of legging or sorry, webbing between her arms. So she'd make like a tent around them so she, they uh, couldn't escape. And um, it's hard to see here, but um, basically um, she would either one, like um, peck a hole um, through, the, through, the, um, through the crab with her beak and inject poison or either that or just like open up the carapace right then and there and just start eating the insides. Um, so I was mentioning the toys. Um, so this um, was her um, first time opening a jar. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but inside the jar, I have a tasty slipper limpet, um, which are, I don't know if you guys have been to like Jetty's Beach, thousands of like slipper shells everywhere. Um, the snails inside, um, when they're alive, are actually pretty tasty, um, at least to marine animals um, and some people, allegedly. Um, and so I have some slipper limpet um, in there for her. And uh, so as I was training her to open the jars, I would um, basically do like a half twist. And then when she got good at doing the half twist, I'd do a full twist and then two full twists. Um, eventually, she was opening jars inside of jars. Um, but uh, this was the first time uh, her getting the food inside of a jar, which was very exciting. And um, as she grew bigger, we moved her from the little tank into a much larger 65-gallon uh, hexagonal tank. And um, she very quickly became a very friendly octopus. So especially when she was in the hex tank, um, almost every time someone came up to the tank, she would like run out of her hole and go right up against the glass and like explore. And um, so this was a time where I fed her um, a crab, which ordinarily is very exciting to her. And she comes out of her cave and is much more interested in hanging out with me instead of hunting the crab. Um, so I, you know, she comes right to the glass. I play with her for a little bit. Um, and I'm like, oh, you know, the crab is like right there. I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure she knew it was there. Um, but I played with her for a little bit. And then I tried to um, basically entice her to like go to the crab just to make sure if she knew it was there. Um, and I think that'll come up in a minute here. Um, she com totally, completely ignored me. She just wanted to hang out. Um, and a little bit later, um, you know, she eventually got the crab. Um, I came back in like a couple hours, it was gone. But um, yeah, she was just very, very friendly. She liked, you know, when people like opened up their fingers like tentacles. Yeah, here I'm trying to like, it's over here, Cthulhu. Um, but she had like no interest. Um, and, uh, now I want to tell you guys uh, a little story about, about the algae scrubber. So, so in that hex tank, um, you know, all aquariums get algae on the side of the glass, and you have to scrub it, and it's like a ton of work. Um, and so we have these um, magnetic algae scrubbers, which are really convenient because um, you have the scrubber on the inside of the tank, and then you have a magnet on the outside of the tank, so you can scrub the algae inside of the tank from the outside of the tank without having to put your hand into a tank with an animal with a beak. Um, and um, so that was um, convenient. Um, one time, though, um, I was in that room with the octopus um, and feeding another animal, and all of a sudden, I hear this crash coming from the corner, and I like, turn around and run right to the tank, and I'm like, what happened? And I see half of the, the magnetic algae scrubber on the floor, and Cthulhu has the other half like playing with it, and I'm like, 
Everything's fine. Um, and then I wait a couple hours, um, and um, you know the, the other piece is just floating around in the tank because she let go of it. And I put it back together and put it kind of at the top of the tank where um, it was kind of out of her sight. Um, little did I know that when I rushed to the tank after hearing that sound, that Cthulhu made some sort of connection there because almost every time I walked past the room and didn't give her attention, I would hear the crash sound and run to the tank, and there she was. I got the mag extra. Well, that was really cute, and uh, that was kind of a cool way that we could sort of communicate where she could you know, tell me in a way that she wanted attention or she was hungry or something like that. Um, but uh, that was kind of a unique story um, from, from her. Um, Let's see, yeah, this is in May, um, and Cthulhu has been growing super quickly. Um, and those of you who know me know that I am not fond of European green crabs. Um, they are terribly invasive on Nantucket. Um, they're destroying our eelgrass, eating um, scallops and clams. Um, they're also out-competing local crabs for food. Um, and so this was the first time I gave one to Cthulhu, and it didn't last long. Um, but anyway, we are super excited because, you know, we feed our green crab, at the aquarium, we feed our green crabs to our lobster, Clementine, um, who's like enormous now and loves them. Um, but, you know, we have like little kiddos bringing us green buckets and buckets of green crabs all the time. And we're like, oh, we, you know, have nothing to do with them. We were super excited um, that Cthulhu liked to eat them as well. And... Um, so that was exciting, and uh, yeah, green crab posed no threat to her. And you can see she's a lot bigger now, um, and she's almost fully grown here. Um, and, and I was mentioning uh, enrichment before, and you know we had the toys, um, and my my favorite toy was um, one that I made that had a fishing bobber at the top, and then kind of like a chain link of um, cable tie, like little zip ties, and then the jar below it. So she would have to open the jar, but also figure out. Why is it floating? And she'd like, you know, bring her tentacle down and pull down the, the floaty um, with the jar on it. Um, but my favorite way to enrich her was actually um, putting a bunch of shore shrimp in her tank. And, you know, we remember from the video before that when she was super small, one shore shrimp was a big meal. Um, but we, when she was bigger, um, we put like, you know, a dozen of them in the tank. And um, they were great enrichment because um, they're pretty smart. And when they get scared, they contract their tails and like jump and bolt. And she'd have to figure out like, oh, where to go? Um, and here, I don't know if you can see, she wrapped her um, arm around and grabbed it with a, with a different tentacle. Um, but she loved um, eating uh, those shore shrimp as well. And, um, and yeah, so... Um, Cthulhu is no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, if you guys want to um, read more about her, I believe our, her obituary is still available on our Instagram account. Um, but uh, she, fabulous uh, octopus, a great ambassador to her spe um, species, um, and. I mean, it was just absolutely magnificent, um, you know, watching her come out and hang out with almost all of the aquarium guests, except for, you know, if we fed her in the morning, she'd hang out in her cave and digest for, you know, maybe 20 minutes or so. But um, she was just a fabulous um, animal. And, um, and yeah, she definitely had an impact on, on many aquarium guests, um, including uh, the folks that got to see her as a baby when she was at the Natural Science Museum. And um, yeah, she, she is missed very much. And that is everything I have. Do you guys have any questions? Hey. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. So now we'll take questions from the audience. If you could please raise your hand and wait until you get a microphone. I, I, um, I assume they don't have any teeth but what do they have for digestive organs? Um, yeah, so they have, they have a normal digestive uh, system with like a stomach and intestine. Um, they don't have teeth, but they have um, a beak, which is a, a hard, like rigid structure. So they are able to crush things and um, manipulate them like that. Um, but yeah, they, they have a normal digestive system in, in uh, their mantle, which on this guy, you know, is, is here. So they eat things. Um, their, their mouth is like directly below. Um, their eyes and um, digested, and um, the the siphon um, is the like excretory organ. So their waste comes out through the siphon on the side of of their body. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, why why are they sh so short lived? What is the 
means, why do they live such short lives? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question, which um, scientists are still kind of wondering about right now. But um, one of the best theories that I've come across is that um, adult octopuses are um, extremely ecologically powerful individuals. So um, an adult octopus can r really impact the um, crustacean and mollusk community you know, immediately around their den. So they're so effective at hunting crabs and clams and things like that, that if there were tons and tons of octopuses, you know, the crab populations and um, bivalve populations would totally, um, you know, collapse. And so the short lifespan allows them to um, basically not compete with their young. Um, so um, if all of their, if, if the adults and the young survived, had long lived lives, then there would be no food for them to eat. Um, so I like, you know, just off the top of my head, I wouldn't be surprised. They, there were once were longer lived octopuses and um, they were, you know, basically destroyed their ecosystems. And then the ones that were shorter lived um, actually survived. Lived ones, um, or um, yeah, basically like their offspring, like, didn't compete with, or the adults didn't compete with the offspring, so the offspring had um, a higher likelihood of passing down their young. Um, but yeah, that's basically the best answer we have for that. Is their eyesight good? Great question. Um, they do have pretty good eyesight, um, although their eyes are still being studied because um, they, they don't appear to see colors kind of like we do. Um, and, and so they can see like polar li polarized light really well, which um, is kind of hard to conceptualize. But um, I don't know if you've ever worn like polarized sunglasses and you can see through the water better because it kind of cancels out the reflection off of water. But um, so, so octopuses have, have good vision. It's just a little different from ours. Um, and um, but yeah, they need, they need good vision because um, when they're hunting, um, they need to be able to like they can they can smell really well and feel really well as well. But um, their their vision allows them to hunt prey really effectively. Um, have you? Uh, would you or do you eat octopus? Great question. I was anticipating that one. Um, I haven't. I haven't eaten octopuses for many, many years. Um, you know, since learning about them. Um, not that you know I'm advocating that you know people don't eat them, but um, I, I haven't eaten octopus in a while. Um, and for those of you who haven't tried it, it's very similar in texture and and to somewhat to some extent flavor to um, to squid. Um, but um, and the main reason I don't eat octopus is because um, in a lot of um, areas they are being overfished. Um, so at, at a lot of places, the, the octopus product is not like a sustainable um, product. But um, but yeah, there is a growing movement. Um, you know, folks choosing not to eat octopuses after learning about how intelligent they are. Um, some people can you know compare their intelligence to cats, and like we can't you know conceptualize like wanting to eat cats. You know, um, but. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really eat octopus anymore. First of all, that was great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, can you tell me, do the suckers taste, different suckers taste different tastes? Does that make sense? Um, like the tongue has different sections that taste differently, right? I, yeah, so I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I'm pretty sure um, that the chemo receptors on the suckers are are more or less similar. So, like the the suckers at the end of the arm are kind of have the similar taste capability as the as the ones that are you know closer to the mantle, um, with the you know exception that like you know the bigger suckers will have more chemoreceptors than the smaller ones. So um, that being the only difference that I know of. Question. Um, I was curious when you said that, that one octopus was so um, poisonous, how about a regular octopus? If you just happen to and it just thinks your hand is food, like how much of a shot of poison are you going to get? Yeah, great question. Um, so um, like I mentioned, 
all octopuses are to some extent venomous, um, but most octopuses are not considered to be hazardous to people. So like a common octopus, for example, um, if it like really you know, wanted to hurt you, it wouldn't be like a hospital trip or anything like that. Um, they're actually, like most octopuses are most dangerous to like divers underwater if they like pull like your regulator out of your mouth or something. So that's what people are more worried about, you know, encountering an octopus than getting venom usually. Mark, one more question yeah. uh, about their playfulness, and they don't like to play with each other, but obviously they like to play with humans. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, do we know why? But also, do they play with anybody else out there in the sea besides other octopus? So um, they've been observed like playing with fish, like hanging out in the schools, just like like woo, look at all the silver around me. Um, so they they do you know play with objects and with other animals um, in their environment. Um, and as for, as for why, um, so um, basically octopuses, when they're born, they, um, they don't have a lot of um, instinctual behaviors. So um, like if you have one octopus, um, you have to, or two octopuses of the same species, um, one will learn how to hunt crabs might have a different strategy to hunt crabs than the other one because of its, its learned behaviors. Um, and so, um, the best guess as to why they're so curious is because they're learning, you know, they're, they're exploring their environment, so they're, um, and that helps them learn, you know, how to hunt effectively and how to um, avoid predators, and that their curiosity is, is what gives them those skills um, to be able to hunt effectively and, and yeah, avoid predators like that. So um, if, if they didn't explore and, and do things like that, they might not, you know, learn the best strategies um, to survive. Okay, we just have a few minutes left, so I'll take one more question. Just wondering where would we find octopuses? Are there any around here, or how far do we have to go to find one? Great question. Um, and I actually did a little bit of uh, research anticipating uh, this question, because I've never seen an octopus on Nantucket. Um, so I went over to the sunken ship and asked, uh, Phil Osley, who's been diving the jetties for years and years and years. Um, he's never seen an octopus on Nantucket. Um, although I, a few weeks ago, um, I had one of my touch tanks at the um, Nantucket Science Fest, um, which was a ton of fun. Uh, but I actually uh, met someone who has seen an octopus on Nantucket in the jetties um, but, and has been diving, or I think uh, like snorkeling and free diving there for, for decades and only seen one. Um, so I... My, I guess my answer to that is that, so common octopuses, we're square within their range. Um, and uh, the thing is that common octopuses love rocky environments where they have you know, access to food and can hide. And Nantucket really doesn't have a lot of rocky habitat. We have the jetties, and that's kind of the only suitable ha habitat for them. And it's not even a natural structure. So like when the tides come in, um, and in and out, the water flows th so rapidly through the rocks that it's probably not a pleasant place for an octopus to live anyway. Um, so I guess my answer is they're probably here. Um, they're just not abundant. And um, I, I would also imagine that um, octopus is spawning in the area. Um, you know, during that paralarvae stage where they're just getting thrown around the ocean, I would imagine that octopus larvae come in and out of the harbor, you know, periodically. Um, and so they're probably most abundant during that life, uh, life phase, but um, they're, not, they're not abundant here because we don't. Well, Jack, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your infectious Absolutely. passion with us tonight. I had a great time. <laughs> so fun hosting you. Um, I also want to thank our NHA members for supporting these free public programs. If you are not a member already, you can become one by going online to nha.org. Thank you all for joining us this evening.